So welcome again to the for, uh, Ethics Law and Society Forum. One of the things we want to do with um, our events to the Center for Ethics Law and Society is remember that are here. Um, one of the things we want to do is not only point out um, esteemed guests like the ones we've had in the last couple of weeks and a lot of next week and later weeks, but also we want to profile the exciting things that are happening uh, here within the borders of Sonoma State, uh, both in terms of research by faculty and in terms of student presentations. And so today is sort of the first installment of that uh, portion of the program. And I'm very pleased to um, introduce uh, Dr. Amy Wallace. Amy is a member of the philosophy department. She specializes in uh, social and political philosophy, ethics, German philosophy, as much of experience with Albert Moss, who is a Buddhism, so I wasn't done. Buddhism, uh, <laughs> philosophy of religion, yes. And uh, his latest project, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it involves an interdisciplinary look at capacity, uh, including philosophy, psychology, uh, neuroscience, Buddhism, and bringing all these different resources to bear on uh, the question of compassion. And so today's talk is entitled Compassion and Happiness. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Andy Wallace. Hi, everybody. Um, so uh, we just hired Josh, and I don't know whether this was announced at the beginning of the series or not, but I, I, want, I just want to say how happy the philosophy department is to have hired Josh, how happy we are that we to organize this lecture series, which wouldn't be happening if it wasn't for him, and creating the Center for Everything Society, and added a lot to the department. And I, great, and I want to thank you for allowing me to give a talk. I kind of corralled you into doing that, because I know you were looking for an esteemed colleague somewhere else, but um, this is what you have to do. Now, I'm working on a project on, um, I've, I've been working on compassion, thinking about compassion, what it is, what causes it, why do we value it, should we value it, what is the value of it, for about two or three years, and I'm trying to figure out a theory in which I can make sense of this data. So I've been reading a lot of evolutionary biology, and I've been reading a lot of evolutionary psychology, and theoretical biology, and research psychology. The philosophy, my training, my background is philosophy, does not, has not taken this topic very seriously, at least not in Western philosophy. So Western philosophy, we don't have a lot on compassion. And what we do have on compassion is not very positive about compassion. So you have to look to other traditions, and you have to look to the sciences. And so I'm formulating a theory, quote unquote theory, about what I think the significance of what it is, what its significance is, and why it's important, and why it's especially important for us in the 21st century today. Not just here in Sonoma County, but for all of humanity anywhere on the globe. And I, uh, so I put together this PowerPoint and I'm uh, going to go over some of the main themes and concepts and ideas that are working into this project, which I've tentatively titled The Evolution of Compassion and the Origin of Happiness. Does that sound good? I thought that up on the drive in here. <laughs> Here's a quote from the Dalai Lama. Um, for those of you who don't know who the Dalai Lama is, oh, there. You're here. Oh my God. Oh my God. I got to really up my game. So the Dalai, everybody know, does anybody not know who the Dalai, does everybody know who the Dalai Lama is? Have you, have you heard, not heard, you're too embarrassed probably to say, so I'll explain. So the Dalai Lama is uh, probably the world leading representative of Buddhism right now alive. He comes from Tibet, belongs to a Tibetan Buddhist tradition, and I believe they claim he's the 14th reincarnated Dalai Lama, but I could have that number one. And um, in Tibetan Buddhism, uh, Tibetan Buddhism is a part of a Buddhism called Mahayana Buddhism, and Mahayana Buddhism focuses on compassion. It's probably the most important value in 
Mahayana Buddhism. And Tibetan Buddhism is particularly interested in compassion, and they have a 2,500-year tradition of studying compassion, trying to understand the mental aspects of compassion and the significance of compassion. So the Dalai Lama wrote a book called Ethics for the New Millennium. That's Ethics for the 21st Century. Ethics for us now in the 21st century. And this is a quote from that book. If you want to be happy, practice compassion. If you want others to be happy, practice compassion. Ergo, practice compassion. And this is a quote from Plato. And I don't know where in Plato this quote is from because I, I, I took this from a book by Dachner Keltner, Born to be Good. He didn't, he didn't tell me where it was from. The happiest person is one who has no trace of malice in one's soul. So uh, the Dalai Lama, the Buddhist tradition, contemporaneous with when Plato and Aristotle were writing, agree on this fundamental point. So what I'm going to try to explain to you is why this is true. Why what the Dalai Lama says is true by citing to you the science that I think corroborates the truth of this claim, and then try to explain to you what, what that all means. So, so I have three hypotheses. The first one is a psychological <coughs> claim. Compassion is good for you. I'll explain later what I mean by that. Compassion is good for you. The biological hypothesis, compassion is a heritable trait that evolution has selected in humans because it concomitantly enhances the fitness of individuals and the groups to which they belong. That's why it's adaptive. And the ethical hypothesis, the moral theory that makes the best sense, I, I, I should have qualified that, but makes, that seems to make the best sense so far today for me, of the facts about compassion is Aristotle's virtue theory, which I'm going to update and call compassionate perfectionism. So these are the three points. So if you're going to take any notes, I would note these three claims. And now I'm going to try to explain them all to you in 45 minutes. I, I have too much in here, I know, and I'm cherry picking a lot. Of material that I can't, I did, uh, that I was worried that I had too much, and I probably still had too much. So what is it? Now, I just want to say, when we're looking at questions about definition, especially about something that is so vital to human life, you're looking for an empirical definition. You're looking for a definition that, you're, that, you, that you can revise if you need to as you learn more information about the world. So we're not, we're not just simply thinking in our minds, well, what do I think I mean by compassion, and then listing a set of necessary sufficient conditions. And if it doesn't satisfy those conditions, then it's not compassion. That's too rigid. We want a more fluid, flexible understanding. So we provisionally state what we think it is which orients our, orients our research, and then we learn maybe that we need to revise our definition a little bit. So this definition is based on this book by Paul Gilbert, Mindful Compassion, that I'm using in one of my classes. He's a leading research psychologist and specialist in the biology, of the, the biology and the psychology of compassion. And he suggests that it's a quintessential pro-social emotion that has three elements to it. You are aware of suffering, awareness of suffering. Let's just think about suffering in others. Now, we can also suffer ourselves, and there is a way of, of directing compassion to ourselves called self-compassion, but let's, that's a complication that we won't think about now. Let's just think of the classic cases where you see somebody suffering. Suffering. You empathize with the suffering. You see it, you recognize there's suffering going on, and then you empathize with it, and then you form the intention 
to do something about it if you can. You see suffering, you empathize with suffering, and you form the intention to try to do something about it. You can see suffering and not empathize, can't you? The next time that you squish a spider under your toe of your shoe, you're aware of suffering and you don't care. You're going to kill that spider good riddance. And you can also see suffering in human beings and not empathize with their suffering. In fact, you could intend to inflict suffering on human beings. You might want to inflict suffering on human beings, just like you want to inflict suffering on that fly because you want to kill it. And then you could have awareness, you could have empathy, and you might not have the intention. You could empathize and turn away. You could empathize, get too distressed with the empathy, and turn away, look away. No, I don't want to deal with that. I can't deal with that. We do that all the time. Or you can empathize, not feel the distress, that level of personal distress, and say, what can I do to help? How can I help? How can I help? The people who have compassion combine those three elements, psychologically. Or our central nervous system combines those three elements. The research indicates that the more empathy you have, the more likely you will form the intention to help. So if you strengthen empathy, then that little leap over into intention happens more frequently. This is a kind of a technical definition from one of the researchers on, <coughs> on empathy, Nancy Eisenberg, from uh, an article she wrote in this Visions of Compassion. And, uh, and I'm not going to read it out loud to you. Empathy, if you think about it more, less scientifically, it's an alignment or harmonization of emotion. The other person feels something, they're sad, and you have the capacity to feel sad too for them because you identify with them. Empathy is identifying with someone else who's suffering. You identify with them and you suffer with them. It's not your suffering. You didn't get the cancer diagnosis. You don't have to go through chemotherapy. You know that, but you still are identifying with them. And you are feeling what they are feeling at one step removed. We have the capacity to feel what other people are feeling. We have a brain circuitry that makes that possible. It's the foundation of all meaningful relationships. If you can't empathize, if you can't align your emotions with the emotions of the person you're with, so that when they're sad, you're sad, then you can't have a meaningful relationship. You can't have intimacy. It's essential to our social learning, and it's essential to social coordination. It's an absolutely fundamental, indispensable skill that human beings must have to survive. Although we can have it in different degrees, and strengths, and levels. And it could be fractured, and it could manifest itself among one sphere of influence, and not in other spheres. So it's very complicated. Uh, compassion is a state of selfless motivation. You're not interested in helping yourself. You're not being selfish or self-oriented. You perceive the suffering, you identify with the suffering, you feel the suffering to a certain extent just like that person. When that person is crying, you are crying. as if you were them. You 
you're not thinking about yourself. You're not thinking about, oh, I feel bad, so therefore I'll help them, and then I won't feel bad. You could think that. That is possible to think that. But that's not all that's going on with compassion. It's also possible that you can identify with the suffering of someone else and be motivated to help them. And when you're motivated to help them, your motivation is to help them, not to help yourself. It's to help them. You're thinking about them. You're concerned about them. You want to know what's causing their pain. You want to solve their pain. You want to help them in some way. So it's selfless. It's a form of selfless motivation. We have other kinds of selfless motivation. I'll just put it as an aside. Um, when, you, when you fully immerse yourself in a creative activity, you lose your sense of self. You're, you're just in what the um, Mikhail Chik sent me high says is the flow of the experience. You don't have any sense of self. You also lose sense of time. But compassion is a quintessential state of selflessness. Psychologically, a state of selflessness. If we were to we want to find out what's motivating you. We want to find out what's going through your mind, how you're thinking, how you're looking at the world. You're thinking and looking at the world in terms of how can I help that person. <coughs> so the perspective of compassion is impartial or apartial. You don't see yourself as better than the other person. You don't have pity for them. Pity is what the Buddhist psychologists call the near enemy of compassion, because pity is like compassion. You empathize, you want to help, but pity adds this one extra attitude, which is, that's not going to happen to me, and I'm better than that. I feel sorry for you, but that's not going to happen to me. That's not the attitude of compassion. The attitude of compassion is, that could be me, that will be me, in some way that will be me. Even though I don't have a cancer diagnosis now, I'll probably get a cancer diagnosis, or I'm going to get some diagnosis at some point. That could be me. I am you. You are me. We are one. We are connected. We are identified. <coughs> Thank God it's not me right now, so I can help you. So it's intrinsically a perspective of impartiality. You're not favoring yourself and of egalitarianism, of equality. You're on the same level, it doesn't matter. A handicapped person, it doesn't matter. Somebody with autism, somebody with born with a, with a brain damage, doesn't matter, someone has CP, whatever. Could be you, and in principle it could be you. And in principle it's just lucky it isn't you in some ways. So, um, possible to have this intrinsic selfless intention, act on it, and at the same time promote one's own interests, biologically and psychologically. And I'm just throwing that in there because I'm going to come back to that later. So just because you are selflessly motivated, and if you're a compassionate person, you don't feel like this is some loss. Oh my God, now I've got to go do this when I, I you know, I could be, you know, doing, eating at nice hamburger. No, you want to help. It's, it's not a burden. It's a joy. It's not a burden, it's a joy. But you're entirely focused on helping the other person. You're not thinking about yourself at all in any way. I idealized state of compassion, of course, we're more complicated than that, and we're compassionate, and we're not compassionate, and we're selfless, and we're selfish, and so. All right, so let's just, just some basic concepts, pro-social emotions, pro-social in general is action, and the motivation that drives it, that benefits others. Also may benefit the person providing it. Compassion belongs to a family of closely related such pro-social emotions, Resources of motivation, and I think this is my own inter interjection here onto the science of the data, stem from a common root and a fundamental caring for or nurturing concern. Parental love, familial love, friendship, gratitude, forgiveness, generosity, sympathetic joy, sympathy, kindness, so on. These are some examples of other of the emotions that <coughs> passion belongs to that family of emotions, and my the hypothesis is, is that it's an expression of this root nurturing capacity that we have. 
the Brahma Viharas of Buddhist psychology and ethics are uh, loving kindness, uh, sympathetic joy, which is happy when other people are happy, um, <coughs> compassion, and equanimity. I, I, I didn't put equanimity in there because it's more complicated to figure out. Compassion is the expressive motivation, it's this balancing. The, 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 the irony, the paradox, the, the irony of this, if you, if you read much biology or sociology, you've got to get used to the irony and paradox. Because you can't get away from irony and paradox when you start reading biology and sociology. It is not a clean, logically clean world out there, unfortunately. So we just have to get used to it. So the, 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 the irony is that when we've studied the people who have heightened senses of compassion, they've been meditating forever and ever and ever, and they, they, you know, we feel like we can correlate. They have higher states of compassion. Higher states of compassion. Much calmer people. Much calmer. You would think empathizing with all that pain would make you agitated. Oh, there's this pain. You're suffering. You're suffering. You're suffering. They're suffering. Everybody's suffering. There's so much suffering. And you would get overloaded and shut down. And you could... No, they find out that people are more compassionate are the ones who are more grounded. They don't get overwhelmed with the recognition and the empathizing with the suffering. So it's interesting why that's the case. Uh, so here are some other, I'm just cherry picking some what I think are the most important facts. Compassion is constrained by our social affiliation. Begins in kin relations, in the, in the uh, family, and uh, extends outward. And we, you know, we live in complicated societies, we belong to all kinds of groups and subgroups. And I just listed some examples of the groups, and there's other groups and probably other kinds of groups that you belong to that I haven't listed up there. But, you know, if, you're, if, someone, if someone's a stranger to you, but they show up at your church, you might be more compassionate to them. If someone belongs to your nation and you, you run into them traveling in a foreign land, you might be more compassionate to them than a, a local. If someone, you know, you belong to these voluntary organizations, you go bowling or you have a book club or whatever. But it could also be your race or you could deconstruct the concept of race and gender. It could be your gender. It could be the species. And it can go out as far as sentience itself. And that's where it ends because sentience is defined in part by suffering. So you're not going to be able to have compassion for anything that doesn't suffer. Doesn't, can't suffer. So, you know, rocks, as far as people know, aren't doing any much suffering. They don't have a metabolism, they don't have a central nervous system, so they don't have suffering. So we, don't, we can't have compassion for them. We might like them, but not compassion for them. Infants as young as two exhibit rudimentary forms of compassion and helping behavior towards strangers. So there's a famous case where they put these babies in a room and had a stranger come in, and a stranger you know, a parent had knocked off something onto the floor and then acted like they didn't know where it was and the baby would come up and grab it and give it to them. More, more likely than not. Now, if the baby thought that the person knew where it was, it wouldn't do it. It's early. This is very, very early in, in a human being's life. It's limited by a concern with yourself. And the more you obsess this concern with yourself, the less capable of developing and expressing compassion it is, and vice versa. These work in oppositions. So if you become a more compassionate person, if you have a character as a compassionate person, you're not going to be obsessing about yourself. You're not going to be thinking about yourself that much. You'll be thinking about yourself, but you won't be worrying about yourself. You'll be fully engaged in the world. You'll be engaged with your connections with other people. But, you know, these are idealized. They're, you know, we're, we're everybody's on a continuum. So it's like a muscle. Uh, you can develop it. You can use, you use it or you lose it. It, mindfulness, it turns out that mindfulness meditation develops it. It's directly connected in. The effects of mindfulness meditation on the brain are exactly the same effects of compassion on the brain. 
the same parts of the brain that control compassion in our central nervous system are the same parts that are stimulated and developed by mindfulness meditation. It's no wonder that in Buddhism, because they, you know, maybe because of the meditation came first, but all of a sudden they were becoming more compassionate, they developed a philosophy about compassion that it's hard to say. Strengthening it develops it. You can strengthen it through visualization, through imagination. Simply exercising it strengthens it. As one develops it, its scope of application extends further and further. So if you developed and maybe you really cared about people, you know, in your little community where you came from and you saw somebody else and you wouldn't feel that compa they were suffering, it wouldn't really move you to do anything. And now it might move you to do that. And the more you develop it, it might move it. So you, and you might even go as far as being, as being moved by pain in animals, non-human animals. And be very concerned about the suffering of non-human animals. Because they can suffer. They suffer a lot. There are sentient creatures that suffer a lot. But generally, human beings don't, don't empathize with animals. Most, most, most human beings empathize they with their pets, but it's very limited. So there's, there's an ex example of the constrained expression that, of human beings have for empathy for animals. They might empathize with their dog. Like, I was at a, I was at a party in, in Mexico one time, not that long ago. And this woman was saying, I'll eat anything, I'll eat anything, I've traveled anywhere and I'll eat anything. And she was holding her little, you know, shih tzu, you know, in her lap. And I said, would you eat your little baby shih tzu? And she looked at me like, oh my god, what are you talking about, right? So she'll eat, every, she'll eat my shih tzu, but she won't, eat, she won't eat her shih tzu, right? She's got very limited compassion for shih tzus. But anyway, so it's, uh, we start out limited, very, very limited. We care most about our family our parents and their children and our parents, and then maybe if we have siblings or siblings. That's, that's, that's the origins of the expression of compassion. That's where it starts out. We start there. Some people never leave there. Then we go from there to your tribe, and then you just stop at the tribe. Uh, but other people can go out much farther. You can, in principle, can go out. People who have been training themselves in compassion training uh, feel maximum compassion for all sentient life. It gives people deep gratification. So we correlate. People who are compassionate and motivated from compassion feel a sense of deep meaning and purpose and gratification. It's sustainable. It's, it's pleasurable. It's linked into our reward system. But it doesn't place us on what the psychologists call the hedonic treadmill, which is every, every time you eat that piece of chocolate, it goes away, and it creates a little stronger <coughs> craving, and you got to eat more, and then it goes away. So the hedonic treadmill is in, uh, uh, intrinsically frustrating. You're never really satisfied. It's a, satis it, it's a kind of satisfaction that causes more satisfaction. So it's very frustrating to people. To be, you're on the hedonic treadmill. And uh, the, the satisfaction of compassion and the other healthy based uh, emotions doesn't put you on the hedonic treadmill. You don't, it, it's sustainable. You don't feel like, oh, I got, you know, it's, so it's, 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 a, it's a different tweaking of our uh, reward system. Okay, so let's make the move over to why it's good for you. It's good, it's a good, and it's good for you because it contributes as means and ends to a fundamental good, namely the good of human flourishing, what Aristotle called happiness, eudaimonia, living the good life, the best life. And we're going to understand flourishing as op optimal, optimizing health. Balancing the present with the future, and we can look at optimal health under you know many many categories. But let's just focus on the physical, the emotional, the individual, and then let's distinguish between intrinsic and extrinsic goods. And intrinsic good are benefits for your health that just come from the expression of compassion itself, regardless of anything else that happens. Those would be physical, emotional, individual, psychological benefits. And then the intrinsic goods are benefits that depend on factors outside your control. So you're, you're, you, you help somebody, you're compassionate towards them, and then they come back and help you when you need them. That's an example of an intrinsic good. And if you're somebody who's more likely to be compassionate, then other people are more likely to help you. They're inclined to help you. They want to help you. You stimulate their helping behavior. Your helping behavior stimulates their helping behavior. Those are extrinsic goods. Because, you know, you could have bad luck. Like that aid worker who got his head cut off, uh, he was probably a very compassionate person. Is this kind of one? He was a very compassionate person. He was, motivated. he was an aid worker. He wasn't even a journalist. He was, he was working to help the poor people of Syria who were being devastated by this war. And he got kidnapped and he got his head cut off, right? So 
Um, so much for compassion. So this is just some of the work that um, I think is relevant. Here are the physical benefits. So there is data. The data is emerging, and more and more we're collecting more of it. But there is data that shows there's a reduction in stress. There is a strengthening of the immune system. There's a strengthening of your cardiovascular system. And there is a very strong body of evidence that shows there is a reduction in your pain and suffering. John Kevin Zinn developed uh, compassion training and mindfulness training in a program to reduce chronic pain and suffering. And found that if you go through his eight-week program, you can get up to 60% reduction in your pain and suffering without having to take any drugs, chemicals. That's a lot. And the emotional benefits, increased sense of meaning and purpose, confidence and maturity. I've seen this in the students that I teach my compassion class to. A female student, um, a student at the beginning of the year said she was very shy and she couldn't get in front of the class and talk about the class, talk about anything in front of the class, didn't want to do that. At the end of the academic year, you wouldn't believe that she had any problems at all speaking in front of the class. It was, I, I couldn't believe her. I thought she wasn't telling me the truth when she said that, that, that she was shy and she didn't have the confidence to do that. So I've demonstrated, I mean, anecdotally, but it, there's correlation. You, you increase in confidence. The best leaders are the ones who are most compassionate. They're interested in the welfare of the group. They're not interested in aggrandizing the group for their own personal benefit. Those are the bad leaders. The, good, the leaders who are interested in the benefit of the group more likely generate the trust and authority of the, of the people that they're trying to lead. And uh, there is correlation between an in increase in your ability to express your talents and skills, increase in creativity, increase in experiences of flow. It's intrinsically good for you just because <laughs> there are a lot of other people out there who also have this compassion gene in them. And they respond to that. And people generally respond from reciprocity. And if you're kind to them, they will reciprocate to you. We're, we're wired that way. But these come from outside you. And so therefore they can be taken away. So I would say that that aid worker, before he got cut, before he got caught and, and had his head cut off, probably had these other benefits of compassion. Already he was, his life was enriched and meaningful. That's what led him to go into a very dangerous area and risk his life because he was motivated by compassion and selflessness. But it was so dangerous, he had bad luck. Just simply had bad luck. You can't eliminate luck. You can't blame compassion for the bad luck. It's an exponential multiplier of value. The more one helps others intrinsically, the more others help one, the greater overall increase in value. I, I had one student do a project where she wanted to clean up around the dorm here on campus somewhere. You know, like they like trade a garden and somebody walked by and they saw what she was doing and they said, can I help you? And then someone else walked by and said, can I help you? And then all of a sudden she had a community. Those cuffs are huge. There are so many reasons to love skulls. A brand new exhibit at the Capitol Academy of Science and Technology is happening in Washington, D.C. This Saturday, February 18th. It's a multiplier of value. Now all these students would be sitting by themselves in their room, maybe depressed because they didn't have any friends. We now had all these friends were energized. So it seems to be essential to our optimum flourishing, to a healthy life, compassion. The psychological data is pretty credible and strong that the more compassionate you are, the deeper meaning and gratification you have in your life. The overall greater health you have with your immune system and your heart, you'll be enmeshed in more meaningful, powerful social connections. You'll be, there'll be lots of people in your life. Whenever something bad happens to you, there'll be plenty of hands to help. You're fully, positively engaged in a rich community. It's a good life. When you talk to people, and they just, and you ask them, do you, do you, do you, how subjectively satisfied are with your life? It's very, very high. And they've asked people who are very, very rich. They have a lot of money. 
but nobody likes them, and they can't stay married, and their wife wants all their money, and their friends want all their money, and they're isolated, and they are unhappy. And if you ask them, how has what you are with your life? Oh, they have all the prestige and the status and the recognition of the great wealth they have. It's not enough for people. It's simply not enough. As people report it. All right, so here's the paradox. So compassion is good for you. We want what's good for us. Compassion is motivation where you're not motivated for what's good for you. You're motivated, you're motivated for what's good for the other person. So if you really want what's good for yourself, don't try to get what's good for yourself. If you really want what's good for yourself, try to be somebody who cares about what's good for the other person. It's a paradox. If you want to, if you want to pursue your own self-interest, don't pursue your self-interest. If, if, if you want happiness for yourself, don't go out there and try to get happiness for yourself. Go out there and try to get happiness for someone else. And then you'll get the best happiness there is. It's kind of a paradox. It's a psychological paradox. Of course, I'm, I'm exaggerating it for, for, for the shock value, which is obviously very shocking, as I can tell from the expressions on your face. So our psychology of helping motivation places us in win-win or non-zero-sum social interactions. When I help you, I feel good, I win, you win. You win, you, you've got some assistance, you know, whatever, I helped you, I was able successfully, but I was able to help you successfully. And then I also benefited from it. It wasn't a loss for me. It was also a win for me. So I, you know, what time is it? Are we running out of time? I'm going to skip this, all this neurobiology. You know, uh, it's really interesting. I talked about a little bit of it. Um, now, let's go to the biology. So evidence that empathy and compassion are coded genetic. There's credible and growing evidence that helping behavior benefits both the provider and the recipient. So this is just this win-win, non-zero-sum language. Our helping psychology motivates us to create and participate in non-zero-sum social interactions, win-win interactions. We make them possible. So the key task is to explain how this could have evolved. There's no consensus about this. So I, I'm, uh, I have my own. Are there any evolutionary, are there any evolutionary biologists in the room? Okay. So I have my own thesis about this. Um, everybody agrees that it happened during the Pleistocene epoch, like 8 million to 2 million years ago. And what happened, everybody agrees about these facts. Increase in brace, brain size is connected to social ability. Because the human infant's brain develops outside the woman's body, at least two more years of very powerful development, and then up to 13 years before the central nervous system can develop enough that you could be autonomous. Human beings need to have people who are motivated from compassion to take care of us. We need that. So if there were some people who genetically were more inclined to take care of their children because they loved them versus others who didn't, they would be more successful. They would reproduce more. And they would spread this gene more and more. We don't just need it from our from our immediate family. Our immediate family needs it from other people outside the immediate family, the extended family, and then human beings who aren't in your family. So our larger brain size requires nurturing, the caring for social interactions, and our nurturing social actions require this larger brain size because that's what produces the empathy that enables us to trigger the compassion response. So the key adaptation, I think, is not, not, not so much fire or meat 
or all those are relevant, there's not just one, but I think what hasn't been emphasized enough is that we have evolved a non-zero-sum helping social psychology. This actually in us, a selfless psychology, a psychology of helping. And this psychology provides the motivation for taking care of the children. And this psychology is what makes it possible for us to create greater and greater and more complicated social affiliations. And, uh, because, we, because compassion can be expanded, we can extend it farther and farther out and sustain larger and larger social groupings. So it's the key to unlocking the riddle of our evolution. Because we benefit directly from providing benefits to others, they have been able to construct, maintain, and reproduce the social interactions and group affiliations that we need. And this is, this, this is, I don't know if this is absolutely right, but this is how I think it, it worked out chronologically. Um, <coughs> originally, very little, our hominid ancestors, we had very little compassion, very little, probably just hardly any. Hardly any. And then, it, and we lived in very, very small groups, we had small brains, we, you know, we were, we were early, early ancestors. And then we started to develop compassion for our kin. Love for them. And that's the first step. So that enabled us to create you know, stronger family units. And then those could expand. And then I think the next step was that we were able to develop a psychology of reciprocity. Which is basically the psychology is I'll be nice to you initially. And it, but if you're rude to me, then I won't be nice to you again. But if you change your mind and you start to be nice again, then I'll start being nice to you. And if, and if I'm nice to you and you're nice to me, then great. I'll continue to hang out with you and I'll you know, do things for you and I'll expect that you'll do that for me. So it's a kind of attenuated form of compassion mixed with selfishness. And we evolved this, so we then extended this out farther from the family. And the growth of non-zero sum <coughs> expanded further. And then as our social structures became more complicated, our ability to just simply have a non-zero sum psychology emerged even more. So we are a chimera, which is this Greek concept of a, of a creature that has many different parts to it. We, we at, at our earliest level, we're selfish, root selfish. And laid on top of that, not eliminating it, but laid over it or developing out of it, is selflessness. Selfishness and selflessness are in us. So there, right now the latest thinking is, is this theory of selection where there's selection working at the individual. Uh, all right, I forget it. Uh, so let this, I, I just want to end up with the ethics. I know I went through the biology too fast. So. Read, read it when I write. Um, so Eric, go back to Aristotle, wrote in the 5th century BCE. He wrote that the origins of, of ethics lies in the human interest of, in having a good life. And the virtues and the vices are the means and ends of having a good life. And we're compelled to develop our capacities because we're compelled to live a good life. And we can't live a good life unless we develop our capacities in the right kind of way. That's what virtue and vice is. And moral education is developing those. And we want to develop those. And part of these is an individual, there are individual virtues are developing your own talents. And the great bulk of it are social virtues like justice, generosity, friendship, and so on, which have to do with our capacities for creating and maintaining and promoting our social relationships, our selfless psychology. So I think this is, the, this is the model that we can combine with um, evolutionary biology. Humans do clearly care about their own flourishing. They care about the flourishing of others. Compassion and the other helping emotions are essential to our health. The more we develop them, the healthier we are. And it seems clear that health is adaptive. It enhances our reproductive fitness at the same time as enhancing our psychological health. <coughs> So 
So from a biological point of view, it makes sense to have a desire to develop, to develop these capacities, is developing them is good for us and good for the groups to which we belong. So compassion plays an essential role in that. And I think our calling is to become more compassionate. Biological nature has determined our ethical nature to develop our innate individual social capacities through developing our innate, evolved, helping, win-win motivational psychology. And this is just some stuff about the problems facing society today are global problems. Global warming, poverty. We live in, a, we live in an interconnect, economically interconnected world, and it's increasingly becoming more interconnected. And because it's becoming more interconnected, we need to develop, we need to expand our evolved psychology to support that interconnectedness. If we don't do that, we won't be able to solve these problems. Maybe we won't solve it. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's gone too far. Maybe we can't develop our compassion that far. Maybe we're too limited. Or maybe, maybe we'll be able to adapt. But that, that's my reading of what's happening, is that if we can become more compassionate, develop a global, uh, meaningful global institutions of justice that are supported by that, then we can solve some of these global problems. But if not, then we won't. I'm done. Thank you. Official uh, class clock. We have two minutes. So, if there are any questions? Yeah. I'm curious. What is you know, sort of analysis of compassion? Doesn't it sort of make the the most popular Well, it's not necessary because although some people are motivated, obviously, to help other people to put a status that those people. So that's, that's also possible. Uh, but that's another case. But apart from that, I believe that there, there also has to be a genuinely selfless motivation. Genuinely selfless motivation. And that, but you will benefit from it. So in a sense, I think it's a moot point. Because you're going to get the benefits that matter most to you. If you're not motivated to help yourself directly, if you're genuinely motivated from empathizing with the suffering of the other person, you have to have a conversation between our biological self-interest and psychological Right, right. It's in our biological self-interest to be selfless. It's not conscious, not necessarily conscious. It happens behind your back. Nature took care of this problem for us. Uh, back then, nature. Um, I'm just wondering, some business nature, what role do you think compassion plays in business in terms of fiscal success? Not much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but then, you know, but you know, we created an economic sphere where we don't want compassion to play a role, right? Because we want to maximize profits. So compassion would interfere with that, right? But that's the problem. Is that it interferes with that. And that's the you know, but you know, website. <laughs> Or you can stop by your iPhone, you know, because they, they use quasi-slave labor to make it for you. Yeah. yeah, the last time I heard you talking about this, you were, the, there was an aspect of this paradox that you were talking about, which, yeah. which bothered you a great deal, and it bothered me too, of the, this thing about if you are being compassionate and saying, oh great, yeah, if I'm compassionate here, I'm really gonna, I'm really gonna make out like a bandit here. And that, the whole thing was that if you are compassionate because it's good for you, you're no longer compassionate. Right. And so I was wondering if you had any more thoughts on that. No, that's absolutely right. Yeah. You can't, you, you're aware of it, right? But, but, you, but, but, you, but you have to, um, you can't let that govern your motivation. So that's the paradox, right? So you're, you're totally aware of it. Like, I'm aware of it, right? So I'm, I'm totally aware of it. But if you, because compassion is already in you, 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 it's, it, it, you you've inherited it. The more you develop it, even if you develop it because you're aware that this is good for you, the more you develop it, the more then we'll get, it's, it's, I, you know, I like to think of it as a disposition. It, it, in, in the right circumstances, you, if you, like in Aristotle said, if you have a, a virtuous character, then it'll get triggered and that will then take over. And the background understanding doesn't play a role in the motivation. It's just a habit. It's creative, right? It's just natural. Yeah, I think that's how it happens. Okay. But you also have to have a sense of irony, too. Mm -hmm.
Sorry to cut you guys off, but we do need to let folks get to the one o'clock class. So thanks again.